Good morning. Have you ever had an event that you felt obligated to attend, but you really didn't want to go? Maybe a wedding of a not-so-favorite relative, or one of those home parties that you said yes to just because a friend asked. How much of an excuse does it take for you to cancel your involvement in one of these commitments? Do you tend to look for ways to avoid these kind of commitments? In those moments, does a temperature of 98.8 constitute a cold worthy of canceling your commitment? Does a sniffle count as a cold? Now compare that mindset with your determination that you have when something you absolutely wouldn't miss for the world, like 90% chance of rain to an avid golfer, or a legitimate fever or sickness canceling a highly anticipated vacation. In a world like ours, I think most of us have come to wor worship one time or another with some serious questions about how God feels about us. Am I a dreaded obligation that he longs to escape? Or does he have a genuine interest in me in spite of all my shortcomings? Here's how I would answer that question. If God wanted out of his commitment to us, we have certainly given him plenty of reasons to do so. Whether you look at historically the cruelties that people have poured out on one another, or very personally at your own sin, we know at the heart level that God has had every reason to say, I'm done here, I'm out of here, especially if he was looking for a way out. But look around. It's obvious that he has not left us to our own devices. He keeps finding ways to encourage us and to bless us. But why? I can come to no other conclusion than this. God loves us. He loves working with his troubled kids. We are not his dreaded obligation, but his passion. It's not his style to abandon anybody, but to relentlessly try to help us all grow in the likeness of his son. As you take the bread and the juice that is about to be passed to you, I encourage you to focus on the bottom line meaning of this time of communion. And the Bible says it best. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. During this time, may you eat and drink, soaking in the transforming power of this commitment that God has made for you. Let us pray. Lord, as we come before your table this morning, we just ask that you calm our minds, Make sure we remember how unbelievably great of a gift you've given us. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Pray with me, please. Dear Lord, as we prepare to give back a small portion of what you so generously given us, we ask that you not only bless but the gift, but the giver, and use it to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> I'm not as funny as you, but I can guarantee that. Morning, my name is Tony Buck, and I'm... Uh, I teach Sunday school class on Sunday mornings from uh, quarter to ten 
to 10.30, and today we finished Jeremiah. Two years, 10 months, 10 days. So I tell you that because if, if you want to join a Sunday uh, school class that goes slow, covers every single verse of every single chapter of every single part of the book, come join us. My class is structured in a way that you do not have to read, you do not have to pray. We have discussions once in a while, you're welcome to join in. But I'm letting you know this morning that uh, the last week of this month, I believe it's the 28th, we'll be starting the book of John. So if you want to join us, you're welcome to. Thank you. Jerry Cherry, Fellowship Ministry. I also have a Sunday school class. Uh, we are very slow ourselves, in a different way, though. Uh, I do make people read, though, but if you sit in the back, usually you don't have to read. So uh, you're welcome to my class. We are in 2 Samuel. Uh, we're almost finished with that. We're going to move on to the life of Solomon. So Sunday morning's on that, but that's not why I'm up here. Tony got me distracted. Uh, I am up here because of uh, Dudes Night Out. Today is the last day to sign up for that. Uh, there's a sign up at the Welcome Center. Just put your name on there. Uh, don't mark paid unless you actually paid. Um, but if there's an issue with paying or you know somebody that wants to go and might not want to pay to watch, we have plenty of people in this congregation who have offered to pay. I think that they must make too much money for what they actually do. So they feel guilty about that and they would love to pay your way. So please do not let that be a reason for not coming. It is a good time to go out, watch uh, somebody play baseball. It may not be the Whitecaps, but uh, somebody. And uh, you can get a hot dog and uh, a pop along with it. So come see me if you have any questions. Thank you all for being here this morning. I am so happy that we've got so much time because we're going to need it. Um, our hymn of decision will be 493, and uh, we are almost done. Speaking of slow, we're almost done with the Sermon on the Mount. Who would know that that would take so long? Um, Jesus would have had to fend them off, and it's lost. It's uh, fast as we're going through this. But um, this is a, um, this section of scripture is, uh, I don't even know how to begin saying it, but just let me say that it, for all of you that are here today, uh, this is going to be one sermon where uh, I'm not going to be stepping on uh, your toes whatsoever. You've got to pass today. So you're coming here and enjoying this, and uh, it's, it's a freebie. Um, so this is, more of a, um, this is more of an educational uh, a warning and an explanation of why we find ourselves uh, where we're at. Um, and explains all of the reasons for uh, uh, the different uh, levels of, uh, of churches and doctrines and all of that stuff. So I'll try to be as, uh, you know, um, witty as I always am, and I'll try to be uh, as bubbly as I can make this. But I think that definitely uh, we need to pray before we get started. So uh, let's, uh, let's go to God. Merciful Father, this is indeed a scripture that is important in our world. And for that very reason, I pray especially that everyone that can hear my voice this morning, that they would intentionally, individually, on purpose, ask that your Holy Spirit come in and speak to them. We don't want any miscommunication. We don't want any misinformation. We want you to tell us what this says to our hearts. 
I pray that we would be patient, understanding, and that we would listen for you and that we might hear you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever passed the house and have been uh, uh, either walking up the sidewalk or uh, maybe there's a, a gate and a fence and, and you look and there's a sign that says, uh, beware of the dog? Uh, I've seen that sign lots of times. I hate, I hate those signs and I hate those dogs. Um, Back when I was uh, young, I uh, worked bus ministry for a church, and uh, uh, I was bitten at least uh, five different times uh, by dogs who didn't even have a sign. And uh, we had to go to those same houses every single week. And it got to the point where the dog, he just had a bib on with uh, utensils. Um, it was just awful. Well, when you see that sign, you beware of the dog, don't you? I mean, you start looking around paying attention. Now, I want you to imagine walking up to a house and seeing a sign that says, beware of the wolf. Whoa. <laughs> Up their game just a little bit. I mean, what would you think if you looked in there instead of a dog, there was a wolf? Uh, I think you'd do a double take and say, you know, I don't think this sale's worth it. <laughs> The title of our message today, if you've got your notes, is Beware of Wolves. That's what Jesus is saying. And when Jesus said that false prophets are like wolves, Jesus said, Beware. Now, when Jesus says, Beware, that's exactly what we should do, is Beware. Jesus says, Not only are these wolves so dangerous, they are so deceptive. And remember this, Satan is not opposed to personal religion. Satan is opposed to biblical revelation. Religion is one of Satan's chief aims. If he can get somebody religious. So Satan comes against the church in two basic ways. Satan comes against the church by persecution. And I want to tell you that the church has been persecuted ever since its beginning. And she's still being persecuted all over the world, even today. Approximately 245 million people a year, Christians, are killed in our world. 245 million a year. We don't see the death in America, but we sure see the persecution. But when persecution doesn't work, he has another way to come against the church. It's not persecution, it's infiltration. And here's the great danger to today's church, the infiltration of false prophets. I hope you're all in Matthew 7 because I want you to turn to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. And beginning in verse 28, Dr. Luke says, records for us, be on guard for yourselves, this is Paul speaking, for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one of you with tears. 
And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Then turn over to uh, uh, 2 Corinthians. Paul wrote a warning to these people in Corinth. He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 13. Such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. Satan is the captain of camouflage. He is the master of disguise. And so again and again and again and again, the Bible warns us of false prophets. And there are three basic things that I want you to learn this morning as we look at this message in Matthew 7. And the very first thing that I want, well, let's read it so you know what I'm talking about. Let's begin with verse 15. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And the first thing I want you to see is the fleece that they wear. The fleece they wear. He says they come wearing sheep's clothing. And I don't know about you, but I'm afraid that for too many of us, we've misunderstood this passage of Scripture. And we think that what he's talking about is that the, uh, uh, the, the, the wolves try to look like sheep. That's the, that's the picture that Hollywood and uh, uh, advertisers and storybooks uh, uh, paint. That's not what this says. He says they come wearing sheep's clothing. False prophets wear wool on the outside, but they're wolves on the inside. False prophets never advertise themselves as false prophets. They're too smart for that. You see, a false prophet will speak just enough truth to camouflage their lies. These false prophets will use our vocabulary, but they don't use our dictionary. What they mean by Jesus and what we might mean by Jesus are two different things. And what they mean by God's word and what we mean by the word of God are two different things. There are churches and people who stand in in, they don't have pulpits anymore. I can't use that example. Uh, they, they stand up in front of people or they sit on a stool in front of people. And they might be holding this book, but they don't believe this book. In fact, for many of them, the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis are just ripped out. They don't believe in creation. They believe in evolution. And I just want to mention Evolution, as taught in our schools, is a misnomer. They teach our children and our grandchildren that those things are fact. Evolution is a theory, never has been proven, and cannot be proven. You watch and watch and watch for years, and I don't know about you, but I keep a track of people. I watch people all the time, and I'm still waiting for that one monkey to turn into a man. Now, I've seen some people turn into monkeys. But I don't think that's evolution. Okay. Listen. In Bible days, shepherds wore the wool of the sheep as clothing. Did you catch that? Shepherds wore the wool of the sheep as clothing. So when he says sheep's clothing, he's talking about shepherds, 
not the sheep. These wolves imitate, try to convince the sheep that they are shepherds, but they're really wolves. You see the difference in thinking? They're not disguising themselves as you. They're disguising themselves as me or higher up, professors in our institutions of learning. And this is what gets so tricky. We believe that if a person is a so-called theological scholar, that must mean that they're Christian. No, that's not true. Commentary after commentary written by so-called smart people are just idiots. <laughs> I had someone call me and they said, uh, uh, Bruce, i got to ask you a question. Back there in, uh, in Genesis, uh, where it says that the, the uh, sons of God and the daughter of men uh, got together and, and uh, created all the problems that was the uh, uh, stimulus for the flood, I, I heard this guy say that those were the, 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 the angels, the fallen angels, had sex with human women. If you believe that, I have a piece of property for you. Um, and we can talk about that afterwards. I'll give it to you cheap. It is prime. Oh, man. Overlooks the ocean. In fact, it's on the ocean. And uh, you never have to worry about water. You've got all the water you can drink. Uh, you just won't drink it for very long. Now, false prophets come in three categories. There are three kinds of false prophets. And if you just look for one kind, you're going to miss the other two. So God has given us description of all three, and it's in one verse. Man, talk about making it simple for you. Go over to Jude, and if you have trouble finding that book, because it's really just a postcard, not even a letter, uh, if you find Revelation, go left. Find Revelation and go left. The last book in the Bible, next to the last book in the Bible, and we're going to look Jude and verse 11. Now this entire book is about false prophets, okay? That's what it's about. The book of Jude is a warning about false prophets, but he describes all three in one verse. Jude 11, woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, and for pay they've rushed headlong into the ear of Balaam, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. The way of Cain, that's one prophet. The heir of Balaam, that's another kind of false prophet. And the rebellion of Korah, that's another kind of false prophet. Three kinds right there. What do they represent? Well, Cain, the first one, represents those who pervert the gospel. Now pay attention. Who is Cain? Well, you remember that God placed Adam and Eve in the garden and they uh, uh, had children. The first two were named Cain and Abel. Remember the story, Cain and Abel? And the Bible says that Abel was a keeper of flocks. And Cain was a farmer, a tiller of the ground. And, and there in Genesis chapter 4, and I've got that at the top of your notes if you want to read it while I'm preaching, that's okay. Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 8, you got the story of these two brothers. Two brothers were now to make offerings. One brother offered to the Lord a firstling of the flock. A perfect lamb was killed, and the blood of that lamb was offered to the Lord as an atonement for sin. The other brother offered to God the fruit of his hands. And what you have here are two brothers, two offerings, two religions, and two destinies. Now Abel, as you will remember, offered the very best, the firstling of the flock to the Lord. Why? Because right there in the dawn of civilization, God was teaching the lesson that we see declared in Hebrews 9 and verse 22. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And Hebrews 11.4 says, By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain. Abel had faith in the blood. Never forget that. He had faith in the blood, and I want to tell you, 
that the blood that was shed on Calvary's cross is not incidental, it is not accidental, it is fundamental and it is eternal. For the Bible says in 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. How much is all? If you gave me all the money in your bank account, how much would you have left over? None. When it says it covers all our sin, that's exactly what it does. Now on the other hand, Cain offered the fruit of the ground. His offering was not based on blood, but the fruits and the flowers of his own effort. No, it may have been impressive. It may have been costly. It may have looked like a county fair when he got done with it. There may have been beautiful flowers and fragrant herbs and righteous fruits, but God was not impressed. Why? You can't get blood out of a turnip. You ever heard that phrase? Oh, these flowers might have looked wonderful. Vegetables might have been so tasty, but you can't get blood out of a turnip. And my friend, without the shedding of blood is no remission. What did Cain's offering represent? It represented culture, not Calvary. Works, not grace. Now there are only two kinds of religion. Pay attention. Only two kinds of religion in our world. The true and the faults. Now we like to divide the world into groups and we call them Christianity and Buddhism and Islam and Mohammedism and rheumatism and whatever. <laughs> we like to say that all of these are different kinds of religions. We even take Christianity and we divide that up into groups. Church Christ, and there's Baptist, and Methodist, and Presbyterian, and Episcopalian, and Catholic, and, but I want to tell you there are only two kinds of religion. The way of the cross, and the way of Cain. That's all. The way of the cross leads to heaven, and the way of Cain leads to hell. Now there are many people today that are trudging to churches and they're sitting down in, in, in pews and worshiping all over America, but they're not going to hear salvation by the blood of Jesus. Because they don't believe the Jesus in this book. And those people who are listening are not going to say, well that guy up there or that woman up there is a false prophet. They're not going to say that. Because this is where they're going to church. But friend, that preacher's gone the way of Cain. And I don't care how many fruits and flowers there are. I don't care how beautiful they are. I don't care how many good works they do in the community or how many things they give away or how many buildings for habitat that they build. The man that leads that church is a false prophet. It's the way of Cain, and they pervert the gospel. Now what about the other man, Balaam? That's the second one that's mentioned there. Balaam represents not those who pervert the gospel, but those whose gospel is a perversion. Who's Balaam? Well, he was a false prophet. We remember Balaam, he had a talking donkey. You can read about his story in Numbers chapter 22. That's a lot longer thing to read, so it'll take you longer while I'm speaking and much more interesting. So just get over there, Numbers 22, and go at it. The king of Moab, he was afraid of the Israelites. And see, they had come out of Egypt, and they were starting to make this journey. And uh, uh, the king of Moab, he got kind of up in arms about it, and he was real worried. And he said, i got to have somebody come along and curse these people because they're just taking over everything. And he says to his uh, uh, aides, what, who's a good person to curse these people? And someone said, well, we've heard about this guy. His name's Balaam, and he does pretty good in the cursing business. I mean, he, he knows the curses and blessings and all those spells to put on people. You ought to see about getting him. So Balak sends for uh, 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 Balaam, and he says, I want you to curse these people. Well, God appears to Balaam, and he says, don't do it. And Balaam said to Balak, you, you can't pay me enough. 
I've got a message from God. I'm not doing it. <laughs> and Balak comes back and he ups the end and he throws in some fringe benefits and Balaam says, I'm in. Because money talks. Now as the story goes along, it turns out that Balaam cannot curse Israel because every time he stands up to give them a curse, he opens his mouth and a blessing comes out. Oh, Balak, the king of Moab, is getting so mad and he takes him here and he takes him there and he gives him different stuff, gives him chai tea to make he change his palate a little bit. He does all kinds of things and he says, now curse these people and he opens his mouth and he starts blessing them. Well, Balak calls the deal off because of breach of contract. Isn't that what that would be? Make a contract, don't fulfill it, breach a contract. So Balaam never gets paid. But Balaam doesn't leave. He hangs around and one day he comes up with this horrendous idea and he says to the king of Moab, I can't curse them, but if, if you can get them to sin, you won't have to curse them. I won't have to curse them. God will curse them. And so the daughters of Moab went in and they began to flirt with the boys of Israel. And there was adultery and fornication and perversion, wickedness. The same thing that's going to cause God to curse America. And my friend, there is a sexual perversion that continues to grow in this country. And there are people who want to normalize this hideous perversion. And they are no longer content to be accepted. They want every person in every church in America to deny God's word. To legitimize their behavior and destroy anyone who dares to disagree with their sin. In Maryland, there was a Christian school that took vouchers in order to educate disadvantaged, low-income children. And because this Christian school taught a biblical worldview that marriage involved one man and one woman, Massachusetts and their less than Supreme Court pulled all of the funding from the state away from that school and then demanded that they pay more than $100,000 in aid that they had received for these disadvantaged children back to the state because of their stance on marriage. There is a movement afoot, my friends, that wants to destroy what you know is normal. Because they're not content with you saying, okay, let's just agree to disagree. No, no. They want you to deny what you believe about God to legitimize their behavior. And they are going to destroy you if you don't side alongside them. Now, one of the biggest pushes that we have seen, and it's not hit West Michigan yet, I don't think, they've got a new program that they're running, and it is with the intention of grooming your children and grandchildren to this perverted lifestyle, and what they're doing is they're bringing in drag queens to our community libraries, and every week they sit in with our children and they read them homosexual stories dressed in drag. Now, if that doesn't curdle your blood a little bit, I've got news for you. Now they're coming into the church. And in April, in the Presbyterian Church in Cincinnati, they had this thing, uh, they've had it for years, maybe you've been in churches that have done that, and the preacher, before he gets doing his real sermon, he'll have all the children come up and sit on the floor and tell them a Bible story. 
one of the drag queens who's a member of that church, has taken over the children's time. And every month, there he is, dressed in drag, not talking to children about God, but reading them books about homosexuality. And what's confusing is the people sitting there, and here's the minister sitting over there, they're thinking wrongly that because he thinks it's okay, it must be okay. Do you understand what Jesus is saying here? They come in dressed in the cloth of a shepherd, but underneath they are wolves seeking to destroy the flock. You see what he's saying? Now there's a third kind of false prophet. You've got to see all kinds. You've got the perverting of the gospel, that's Cain. And you've got the gospel is perversion, that's Balaam. And there's, there's the third one, it's the protest of the gospel, and that's Korah. Now who is Korah? Well, he's found in number 16. He was a gifted man, a man of privilege. He was a cousin of Moses. He, he, he was a, a Levite. He was a priest, prince of Israel. And somehow he got the idea he didn't like the leadership of Moses. He didn't like the leadership of Aaron, and so he rebels. He organized this rebellion against Moses and Aaron. And in the Old Testament, uh, Moses as a prophet and Aaron as a priest, they were antitypes, they were uh, archetypes, I'm sorry, uh, of the, the coming of Jesus, who is our prophet, priest, and king. And so Korah's problem was he didn't like the leadership, this prophet and priest. Moses fell on his face and he talked to God about it and God says, I'm going to handle it. And he opened the earth up and swallowed them, but they were gone. They didn't have to, have to bury them. Just boom, they were, they were out of there. What was Cora's problem? He hated the gospel. And those who represented God's prophet and God's priest My friend, I'm telling you, there are those in America who absolutely hate the message that we preach in this church. I mean, they hate it. They hate the blood. Not that they deny the power in the blood. They hate the blood. They hate the word of God. And they mock and they despise and they ridicule anyone who even hints that they believe in God. And because of their power or their position, they lead the flock of God away. Well, let's move on, okay? Not only the fleece they wear, let's talk about the fruit they bear. How, how can we be sure that they're wolves and not shepherds? Well, in Matthew 7 and verse 16, he says, You'll know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree that bears good fruit, but the bad trees bear bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire so you'll know them by their fruits. Jesus changes metaphors. He's no longer talking about animals. Now he's talking about trees. And God is saying that the devil, he can't continue to deceive because after a while we see it. Let me tell you three things about fruit. First of all, it's the root that determines the fruit. It's the root that determines the fruit. That's what Jesus is saying. You don't get figs from thistles. Now, if you had a fruit tree that wasn't bearing the right kind of fruit, what could you do to get the right fruit on it? Well, here's some ideas. <clears throat> you could prune it, and all that does is make the root stronger. You could... Uh, Transplant it, move it, but it's the same tree, same fruit. It's just a different spot. That's what people do when they change churches. Well, you could cultivate it. I uh, know it's a bad tree, so you could cultivate it. I mean, you could dig around it and pull the weeds and pour on fertilizer. <laughs> and now you've got a bad tree. It's still just as bad, only it's twice as big. 
Or maybe you could just rename it. No, that's a great idea. Let's take this bad tree and we'll call it good. Or let's try to disguise that it's really a church and we'll call it something else. Where do you go to church? I go to the community center. What do you call it that for? So they don't know it's church. We want to trick them into coming. Or the last thing you could do, this is probably the best, you could decorate it. Just pull off all the bad fruit and then take good fruit and start tying it on the branches. You do that with decorations, right? I see people, of course, in Comstock Park, what's surprising to us is in Comstock Park, when we decorate for Christmas, um, because it takes us so long, we leave it there until summer. In some church houses, you know, they're even less ambitious, and so what they do is they finally turn the lights off when summer comes. They've had them on all spring. You drive by, there they are. Sand is still up on the roof, heading toward the chimney. But once June comes, they shut the lights out. And it's not like decorating anymore. So you can decorate the tree. I'm telling you, no matter whether you transplant it, fertilize it, prune it, rename it, decorate it, the root determines the fruit. But wait a minute, let's turn this around. It is the fruit that reveals the root. Because you dig up a tree at least for me, and you just gave me, said, here's the roots, what do you think this tree is? I'd have said, I don't know. Roots can look alike, but it's the fruit that tells you what the root is. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure this out. Jesus was a master teacher. I mean, how simple is that when you read it? By their fruit. Now, there's just one more part. It's the seed that determines the root and the fruit. Isn't that right? I mean, it's the seed that determines the root and the fruit. I mean, you're not going to have the right kind of fruit root or the right kind of fruit unless you put the right kind of seed in it. And the seed, Jesus says, is the Word of God. So when you're looking for fruit, you need not just look at the fruit or the root. You need to look to see if the seed they're sowing is the Word of God. Now here's the third thing, and I've just got a couple of minutes. Look in verses 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Third thing, the faith that they share. And listen, scriptural, uh, spiritual activity without scriptural authority is satanic iniquity. Spiritual activity without scriptural authority is satanic iniquity. Jesus is going to say to these people, depart from me. In spite of their false profession, they say, Lord, Lord. He's going to say, depart from me in spite of their false preaching. We prophesied in your name. He's going to say, depart from me in spite of the false power. In thy name we cast out demons. He's going to say, depart from me in spite of their false performance. In thy name we were doing all kinds of marvelous works. And in spite of their profession, in spite of their preaching, in spite of their power, in spite of their performance, they never knew the Lord. And he never knew them. Now it's important that you understand here that Jesus isn't talking about people who are religious. I mean, who are not religious. He's not talking about atheists or agnostics, people who just out and out deny the Lord. He's not even really talking about cults and those who make no pretense that they deny the divinity of Jesus. He's not talking about pagans or heretics. He's talking specifically about people who are religious. They are convinced 
that they're on the road to heaven when they're really on the road to hell. Twenty-eight years ago, Jeannie and I had a young minister over to our house for supper. Boy, he was a likable young man. His name was Peter. In the way that it was set up in Berkeley, his church was on this corner. There was a street, not a highway or a road, a street, and then our church. And he was going some real tough time. His wife had left him, and so we had him over, and the conversations were going. And he said, uh, uh, Bruce, i got to ask you something because I've heard it about you people. Do you really believe the Bible? And I said, well, yeah, Pete. Don't you? Oh. <laughs> he said, did you go to seminary? I said, no. I thought four years was too many. He said, well, there's your problem. You're not educated. Because if you had somebody that knew what they were talking about, you would discover that all this stuff in the Bible is just myth. There was no virgin birth. There was no flood. There was no Adam and Eve. There was no uh, uh, a resurrection. There was no uh, uh, Jesus that died. That was just a human being. And, and we have made us a living. He says, and I'm part of it. We've taking money from people to give them something to believe in because we all need to believe in something, but you can't believe in this thing called the Bible. It's not real. And Jeannie and I watched his church, and it grew and grew and grew and grew. And they went from 50 to 300 people in no time. And all those 300 people, what do you suppose they left that building believing about the Bible? They stopped believing. Because the man that stood where I'm standing and told those people the Bible is false, he must know. I mean, he even wore robes. I'm not going to start that. I don't care if you believe me or not. I'm not wearing no robe. Never did, never will. That's too much information. Just because somebody says that they're learned or they went to a Christian college or they're a professor or whatever, or a, just because they say that, don't jump to the conclusion that they are what they say they are. You can never jump to the conclusion just because someone says Jesus is Lord does not make him a Christian. There was an elderly lady in her 70s who uh, went to the grocery store to shop. I'm almost done, Bertie, almost done. And when she walked outside, she found four unknown males sitting in her car. Oh, this was a pretty tough old granny, I'm telling you. She dropped her shopping bags, reached into her purse, pulled out a 38 Smith & Wesson, got into a police stance, and said, I know how to use this gun, and I'm not afraid of using it. Get out of the car. Well, these four men did not wait, say one word. Those doors popped open, and all four of them just, whoo! As fast as you could say scat, they were gone. Well, the lady put her gun back in her purse and picked up her shopping bags and put them in the back seat of the car and got into the driver's seat, but there was one problem. Her key wouldn't fit the ignition. The reason why it would not fit is because this was not her car. Her car was identical to this car, but it was parked five spaces down the street. Well, she reloaded her bags into her car and decided she'd better drive to the police station. And well, the sergeant that she told the story to nearly collapsed in laughter when he pointed to the other end of the counter where four pale white males were reparting a carjacking by an elderly white woman. 
Bad things can happen when you jump to conclusions. Jesus said the true Christian that will enter the kingdom of heaven is the one who does the will of my Father. Okay. Five things and then I'll be done. Just going to name them. Number one, you need to study the faith. Study the faith. And we've got Bible studies. We've heard the announcements. But if you're home, just start reading the four Gospels in the book of Acts for starters. Man, start studying that. The book of Acts and the four Gospels. Number two, Show the faith. The best argument for Christianity is a Christian. Number three, stand for the faith. I mean, get a bulldog grip on the Word of God. Next, support the faith. You know what the tragedy of today is? We've got good people in bad churches, and they will not leave. We had Jeannie's sister and brother-in-law up for the fourth. And her brother-in-law and I were out driving, and he just asked me, and you should never ask me a question if you don't want the answer. <laughs> they go to a bad church. I mean a bad church. And I told him, I said, that's a bad church. You can't stay there. Well, their family has roots there. One old southern preacher talked about it. He was talking to a parishioner, and he said, you've got to get out of this church. And the, they said, well, Grandma is buried in the backyard. And that preacher said, I guarantee you, if Grandma could, she'd get up and leave. Because <laughs> she was raised on the old-time religion. And number five, share the faith. People are waiting to know. There are so many places that are telling your children or your grandchildren, that what God says is a perversion. They're saying, this is not a perversion, this is normal. Schools, media, even stores are saying that God is wrong and they are right. It's time we take back the rainbow. Are you listening to me? I am sick and tired of seeing that sign. God gave that to humans as a sign that he would never destroy the earth with a flood again. It's not a sign for pride, for a perversion. If there were ever a message needed today, it's this, where Jesus Christ, the Son of God, says... Beware of the wolves. And if you're here as a mom or a dad and you've not given your heart yet to Jesus, you better come and give your heart to Jesus. And get your family in the Word of God and in the church. I mean a real church, a Bible-believing church, a Bible-preaching church, a Bible church that believes that Jesus is the only way to God. And by his blood, all our sins are washed away. Let's stand and sing hymn number 300, and, I mean 493. As we get ready to leave, there is a message that we need to take, and that is that Jesus loves you. So many people who have neither not heard it or don't believe it, and I pray that we would live in such a way this week that they can see it and know it's true. Give us that ability, opportunity, and power in Jesus' name. Amen.